Here we are, the end of a day that has uh, been pretty exciting, pretty unusual, pretty challenging. We've heard some dramatic things, some moving things, some challenging things. We've seen some opportunities. And now it comes time to ask the big questions. So what? And now what? Does this mean anything? Is this sound and fury? Or does it mean something? Will the excitement of today be overwhelmed by the tyranny of the urgent and the lure of the familiar on Monday? Will it fade into memory? That's completely up to you. That's your job. You now become TEDx West Vancouver. You're the future, if there is one, of this experience. No pressure on you. <laughs> you see, I think Craig thought I would summarize, but I don't have any such intention. Each of us heard a different thing today. Everything resonated with your own unique experience. Now you need to figure out what to do with that. I do have some advice. Don't try to do it alone. Find a friend. Do it in a group. You know, there's a growing awareness that the best way for teachers to learn as individuals and to innovate and make a difference is to work in groups. Professional learning communities or whatever other term you want to apply them, the collaborative work of people together, whether teachers or others, is the most important and effective way to get things done. And the most important way to make sure that opportunities like this do not get lost. It's always easier to persist and to dream and to do something when you work with other people. The topic of those conversations is liable to be teaching and learning in some form. So I want to start my remarks by asking you a question. What's teaching? Surely you can answer this question. Most of you are teachers. It shouldn't take you very long. Do you have an elevator pitch? I don't. And I've thought about this a lot. People ask me, well, you're a teacher, so what makes you a teacher? How come you're a teacher? I prove it. Well, I have a card in my wallet. You know, I have a degree, I have a credential. Yeah, but what's teaching? See, when you talk about teaching, a lot of people say, well, anybody can teach. Like, if you understand something, you explain it to everybody else, and that you have taught them. End of story. But of course, that's not teaching. That's telling. Teaching isn't telling. Well, then what is it? Today, I'm going to share with you what I call a professional framework, which I hope can help you to answer that question. This framework isn't the holy grail of teaching frameworks. It's just an idea that I use. And I didn't invent it. I have adopted it from a long history of experience with the Critical Thinking Consortium. And there's a piece of it that I won't have a chance to explain to you that I got after thinking about what Daniel Pink has to say about motivation and how that might apply in education. But I'm going to talk about a part of it today. And the reason I'm going to do that is not because I want you to use it or to adopt it or to think that it's just a fantastic model. It's because I want to illustrate why it's important to have a model. You can get your own. If you Google around teaching framework on the internet, you'll find a gazillion models. Right? Uh, Danielson has a model that ASCD promotes pretty heavily. The Ontario College of Teachers has a thing that's even called a teaching, le teacher learning framework. So if you can find something that works for you, use it. And if you want to take what I've got, feel free. If you want to modify it, modify it. But what's important is that you have a conceptual model, that you have a way of explaining to others what you're doing and why you're doing it that way. So you can think about it more clearly. And so you can communicate with others better. So that when you work in a collaborative group, your conversations don't pass each other like ships in the night. We use a lot of words that we don't define. Engage, teach, achieve. Until we give them concrete definition and share the underlying assumptions, we may not be communicating at all. So let's take a look. Here it is in all of its glory. I haven't got time to explain it all to you, although I am going to take 36 minutes. I didn't explain that to uh, <laughs> Craig. But, um, but even that wouldn't give me the time. So what I'm going to do is concentrate on the foundational piece, the cornerstones, I'm going to call them, of pedagogy, of a teacher's practice. Now these are familiar words here. Um, but I'm going to take the time to briefly talk about them because I just explained the importance of being explicit with your meanings. Relationships. We all know this is the cornerstone and the starting point. You have to form an appropriate relationship with students or anything else you do counts for not. Now sometimes this is easy. In fact, it's a pure delight. But sometimes it's hard. Some students don't come easily to relationship. They withdraw. They're reluctant. Perhaps they don't find school easy. 
or perhaps they have a very specific learning challenge, or perhaps they're shy, or perhaps that's their personality. You have to reach out actively. My door is open as an excuse for not doing something. You have to reach out actively and establish those relationships. Some kids are not withdrawn, some kids are oppositional, some kids are flat out obnoxious. Some people's behavior is completely unacceptable. You have to make relationships with them too. You have to look past the behavior to the person and reach out to the human being and find a way to relate to them as an adult to a youth, as a teacher to a student, to create a safe, supportive and caring environment where learning is possible. This is a great big job. It's terribly sophisticated. You will never be good enough at it and you'll never finish learning how to do it. And much of what we've heard today caused me to rethink and consider all sorts of things about the relationships, how they are formed, what they mean, and what to do when they go wrong. The next cornerstone is resources. Now you might think immediately of buildings and so on, of computers and dictionaries. But those things are largely beyond your control, except of course the way you set up your classroom, which carries within it all sorts of messages. But I'm thinking particularly here of social and intellectual resources. Teaching involves giving students social and intellectual resources. You cannot assume that students come to your room ready-made and fully competent. They have to learn how to get along with each other. They have to learn how to collaborate. They have to learn to get over their differences, how to disagree agreeably. You have to create the culture of your classroom by first imparting the skills that are necessary to create that culture. And you need to give students intellectual resources so that they can be successful in their learning. This may include simple things like setting a goal, making a plan. It may include more complex things like maintaining an open mind, making a valid decision. It may involve critical thinking. There is a long host of intellectual capacities that don't find their way into the curriculum in any explicit way, but that are completely essential to a student's success. You are the one responsible for helping them to develop those. You can't assume they should have come with them or their parents are going to do it. The third quadrant is instruction. Now when we talk about teaching, this is where everybody's mind goes immediately. And that's fine. There's a lot in this quadrant, everything from the, you know, the strategic level of curriculum development and unit planning down to the tactical level of day-to-day -day practice, asking good open-ended questions, knowing how to respond when things happen in your classroom, using graphic organizers, organizing a class discussion. You'll never get that mastered either. And, but the more tricks of the trade that you learn, the greater your repertoire, the better it is. But instruction is not teaching any more than teaching is telling. Instruction is a piece of teaching. It means nothing if the other three quadrants aren't full. So by all means, spend lots of time talking about that, but don't get lost in instruction. The fourth quadrant is guidance. Now, the first thing that we have to know when we go into a classroom is that we are an adult with children. There is an enormous imbalance of power and you carry all the responsibility. You are in loco parentis. And the first kind of guidance that you have to give is social and emotional. It's supportive and encouraging. But you also have to give intellectual guidance, feedback. And this should be continuous and embedded in your instruction. It's not sending home an interim now and then. It's all the time. It's the way that you interact and the reason that you interact with students is to give feedback. To figure out what they're thinking and why they're thinking it and how they're thinking it and provide some adult guidance and feedback that will help them to continue to progress to a better place. So these are the four cornerstones, I think, of an answer to the question, what does a teacher do? At least those are my cornerstones. Now you'll notice that there are some things not here, some things that affect learning. What about all of a student's personal characteristics, their family life, the community and the culture they live in? Those are all important, but the focus of this model is what you do. What you do as an agent of learning, to, for, and with your students. Many other things impact this, and you need to be aware of them, but the reason you're aware of them is so you can adjust your behavior to take account of them. Teaching is like sailing in some way. You set out with a plan and some skills and a boat, and you want to get somewhere. As soon as you set out, the wind changes and the currents change, and now you have to adjust. You have to have different tack and tactic. Well, that's what teachers do. You don't know what to do until you meet the students. You don't know what to do next until you've done the first thing. You continuously adjust to your understanding of all those other important circumstances in order to get to where you need to get to. You'll also find that the word student is not on here anywhere. That might offend you at first, but this is about you. It's about what you do. Student is embedded in every one of these corners. All of these things are being done with students. 
So how would we know if we were succeeding at this thing that we begin to clarify in our own mind as teaching so that we can think more clearly about it and so that we can talk to other people more incisively about it? How would we know when we had accomplished it? Surviving till June without major calamity, getting many presents at Christmas? What tells you that you are teaching? How do you know when you are succeeding? Well, the answer that we like to give to that, I see I'm one click off. The answer that we like to give to that is, of course, achievement. If the students learn, I'm doing well, I'm teaching. Well, that's nice, that's important, but let's not imagine that kids learn because you taught. Kids learn for lots of reasons. Some kids learn brilliantly if you just don't get in their way. And then to imagine that you're a great teacher because you had the good fortune of meeting them is a little, you know, <laughs> it feels good, but it's slightly delusional. On the other hand, some kids do not achieve, but you may have worked brilliantly and, and heroically and done actually a wonderful job. Can you be satisfied that they haven't learned? Can you say, well, I taught, but they didn't learn? You know, probably one of the stupidest things I've ever heard is you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. There's no place for that kind of thinking in what we do. So achievement is the indicator that we have been successful, but it's, it's fraught with difficulty. And in fact, there's another problem, because if achievement is how you know that you're teaching, then you're liable to teach to the achievement, teach to the test, to narrow your objectives to those few countable and demonstrable outcomes, which are the thin edge of indicators of the richness of the achievement that we really intend. In the middle of the 90s, UNESCO looked forward to what children would need to know to thrive in this world and actually to save us from the directions that we're heading. And they described new directions for education in terms of four pillars learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, and learning to live together. These became known as 21st century learning objectives because that was the title of their report. And they have subsequently been morphed and changed by many people, and they show up here as the seven C's, or in British Columbia now, as the five competencies. Communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creative thinking, personal and social responsibility. Even if we define achievement in these very broad and expanded ways, which we must, we can't really aim for that. We have to go upstream from what we hope for because we plant our seeds before this tree flowers. So what's upstream from achievement? Well, of course, it's learning. So our job is to enhance learning so that achievement will follow naturally. And achievement doesn't either celebrate or acknowledge the full extent of the learning. So learning allows us to have the broad target and the big idea. But I'm going to suggest to you in my particular framework that I don't like to think of learning as the target either. I think we have to go a little further upstream from learning. And what's upstream from learning? What's the necessary precursor to learning? It is engagement. So for me, if I have to answer the question, what does it mean to teach, if I want to reflect on the meaning of today, if I want to formulate a plan for making today real, for giving it consequence by working together with others, I'm going to use a framework about what I mean and what I do and where I can act that has these four cornerstones and aims for the goal of engaging students. But engagement needs to be properly understood. Engagement is not diligent compliance with requirements, dutiful completion of tasks to make teachers and parents proud so that they will tell you you are good. We like that, but it is not engagement, it's obedience. The Canadian Educational Association, in looking at this issue, has labeled that institutional engagement. And it has its merits, but it's not the goal. The goal is intellectual engagement, a more genuine, internally driven, emotional, and intellectual commitment to your learning that allows people to begin to take the driver's seat, to take responsibility, and to exercise direction over what they're learning. This is what we're aiming for. So collectively, these foundations and that uh, end purpose begin to define for me what I think teaching means. And if I were reflecting on today, as I will do and as I have been doing during the day, I would use this framework to help me maintain a balanced perspective. So I didn't get lost in any one quadrant. I have to absolutely learn new methods of instruction. How do I use a computer for this? What's inquiry driven that? I also have to think and rethink and constantly hone my ability to form relationships, especially the difficult ones. I have to learn how to give guidance in a continuous way that can actually be heard and experienced as helpful, caring, forward carrying advice as opposed to judgment disguised as kindness. And I have to learn how to give the intellectual and social tools to students that they need and to figure out what they are. This is very complex work. And much of what has been said today gives me many things to think about. 
And so it's within this framework that I would plan for the future and that I hope that you will plan for the future so that TEDx West Vancouver isn't just a distant memory that echoes into nothing. Now that's my framework, but I'm going to reiterate that's not the holy grail of frameworks. What I'm trying to illustrate is that a framework has value. It allows you to retain balance. It allows you to remember that there is a gestalt to what we do. It allows you to express the complexity of the teaching act in ways that perhaps others can hear and respond to so that you can form uh, communities and partnerships with colleagues and with parents. Unless we can give voice to what we do, unless we can explain it in some reasonably simple, compact, yet elegant way, our ability to connect and to converse is severely limited. So please, if you don't like this one, make up another one, but have one. Maybe you sit down first and negotiate one with people before you set out on the journey of imagining an activity that might flow out of the day. Now when I showed you this at first, there was another layer, and I don't have time to talk about it, but I'm just going to mention it. This is what you do. These are our arenas of action as teachers, a way of thinking about how we can have the impact we want to have. But ultimately, the impact we want to have is way beyond our control. It depends upon student response, and student response is up to students. You can't make somebody think. You can't compel or coerce or lure someone into engagement. They have to come to engagement. You facilitate, you encourage, you nurture, you acknowledge, but you cannot make engagement happen. So student response is the next layer. It's completely beyond our control. What are the elements of student response that are liable to result in engagement is the subject of layer two. And I don't have time to talk about it, but I'm just going to show it to you and again invite you to think of your own. For me, again, building on Daniel Pink's uh, notion that motivation arises from purpose, mastery, and autonomy, and using the Canadian Education Association research, I'm going to suggest to you that number one, students have to see what they're doing as purposeful and significant in their lives. They have to find a personal form of connection to this learning that it is either significant in itself or will allow them to do something that is significant. And the second layer is self-regulation. Now we talk about self-regulation in BC quite a bit today, but, or in BC now, but we've condensed it down to sensory integration and, and actually self-regulation is a much bigger issue. It deals with your metacognitive capacities in the forethought and the performance and the afterthought phases of an action cycle. Students need to develop that ability to carry out their own learning by being managers of it. And the third thing is agency. There has to be the reality and the perception of an ability to affect the way that their learning is going to go, to make certain decisions about what and how they will learn within the constraints of the curriculum, of course, which is a legally binding document and defines our purposes, and also within the realities of classroom life. I think those three things are liable to lead to engagement, but none of them can be directly created. They are student responses to what you can actually do, which is, are the cornerstones in the bottom. So as we end today, I'm going to strongly encourage you not to let this die, to find a partner and a friend, they need not be here today, to talk about what you heard, to think about it, reflect upon it, and as you reflect upon its meaning and plan for a consequence, use an intentional, overt, conceptual framework so that you can begin in your own mind and in talking to others to give understandable meaning to the complex task of teaching, which is what we're here for. Thank you very much for your attention.